This is Mike Hill, and you are listening to the Everything Went Black podcast. Welcome back, my good friend Terrence Hanum from Locrian. You might know him as a musician and visual artist, but did you also know that Terrence is a published writer? We're going to talk about his new book, All Internal, published by Dynatox Ministries. It's in pre-order right now, and it will be released on the 30th of April. Before we get going, I just want to thank everyone for their continued support. Uh, It means a lot to me that you guys are out there listening. I'd also like to extend a thanks to everyone out on Patreon. And uh, once again, I really appreciate your support every month. And if you're interested in supporting the podcast for as little as $1, you can join and contribute funds to the Everything Went Black efforts. Uh, The first thing that actually uh, is coming into fruition is uh, a couple weeks ago, we shot a pilot episode of what I'm hoping is going to be a show related to this podcast. So that's the first thing I did with uh, some of the money that we raised on the Patreon. So the other question is, what's in it for me? If I sign up for Patreon, what do I get? Well, you get thanked by me on the episode. You also get a bunch of free content, uh, such as the Lifetime of Great Skies audiobook, um, the, the uh, version of Heroes that Tombs recorded a while back, and a bunch of other stuff similar to that. And, you know, there's ongoing things I'm going to be working on, which I'll be making available exclusively to Patreon members. So, uh, so there you go. It's, uh, you know, trying to turn this thing into a legit company. And um, that's one of the steps that is part of my overall game plan. And um, definitely would like you guys to help out and be included. If you wanna find me out on the interwebs, uh, Facebook, Michael Hill. I changed my Instagram tag to everything went black underscore Mike Hill. Doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but you get the idea. Twitter, at Mike Hill HQ. And if you wanna support the podcast and you don't have a dollar, You can uh, give us a review on iTunes, give us a star rating, or just tell your friends about the show. And uh, that's all much appreciated. Share it on social media, all that kind of stuff. This episode, like all episodes, is brought to you by Savage Gold Coffee. Go to savagegoldcoffee.com. Also, the affiliate sponsorship of Onnit. If you go to everythingwithblackmedia.com, you'll see a bunch of, or you'll see two actual um, portals that'll take you over to Onnit and you can buy some healthy food and strength and conditioning equipment. Welcome back, Terrence. Um, it's been a while. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah, totally. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is your new book, All Internal. And, yeah, uh, I, I actually didn't know that you, I know you mainly as a musician and visual artist, but I didn't know that you actually were a writer. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I write, uh, normally, I guess I've been writing like about like horror movies, uh, you know, for Bandcamp or Vice and uh, soundtracks specifically. Um, and then I, you know, maybe... About like eight years ago, I started writing my first novella it's called Beneath the Remains, kind of a coming-of-age novella uh, set in the 90s in Florida around death metal and um, this kind of mystery disappearance of a brother. And um, that took a while to kind of get published. And then kind of after I went through that, you know, process, I realized like, I had a few other ideas and a few other stories and something like short fiction that kind of barely qualifies as science fiction or horror or weird fiction or speculative fiction or whatever. So I kind of uh, go in between those places. And then the newest thing is uh, this uh, novella called All Internal. Yeah. Yeah. You sent me a, a PDF of it and I, I skimmed through it. I didn't actually read the entire thing yet. And um, I am massively offended. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, damn. I should have lied. <laughs> I know telling the truth gets me in trouble sometimes. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> no, I, you know, it's, I would like, you know, I would qualify this as what the, uh, 
so-called body horror. And sure. uh, yeah. So, um, what, you know, it starts off pretty abruptly like that introduction with this, this chat. So, so you want to go into a little bit about like, you know, where this, uh, this dark little tale came from. Sure. It was, um, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm kind of inspired by a lot of like kind of, some of the not so abstract but philosophical concepts. So this was about like the mind body problem in philosophy. Like, are there other minds? Do other minds exist? And I started kind of, that's always just kind of drawing in the back of my mind from like when I was in college. And, um, and then I started thinking about really, um, you know, how this kind of distancing technique of pornography and internet technology and all this stuff that is so intimate, but it's so distant and it's so, um, you know, you can observe things that, you know, can be, can be very cruel um, and very arousing and sometimes both. Uh, and I started kind of, it just kind of all folded over into itself with this, with this story kind of came out of it. Um, but uh, so it is a lot about technology, like about these chats. Uh, the main character, Anita, is originally like this cam girl. And, um, and then she kind of, her mind kind of splits and it, and then this other intelligence takes over that pushes her for these other reasons into kind of, uh, actually making, uh, pornography, uh, to replicate, um, other people. And that just sounds entirely, I don't even know what words I'm just saying right now, but that's kind of where it came from. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's actually, it's, it actually triggers, like when I was reading through it, um, what came to mind was the way your gut biome has all these different organisms living inside of it. And some of the cravings that you get are actually those microorganisms motivating you. For example, um, I think I forgot the name of this uh, type of, I think it's called candida or candide, candida. Huh. And if you feed yourself sugar, right? And yeah. it, this thing multiplies inside your gut, in your large your intestines, and it sort of connects into your conscious, into your brain rather, because you know your your gut has ton, thousands, tens of hundreds of thousands of neurons, so it's it, it actually drives you to eat more sugar. Wow. Yeah. So there's like I'm not, su I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, as you know, like uh, we've we've messaged before about like the paleo and keto diet. Yeah, and exactly. Where sugar fits into there, and uh, I'm 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 like half I'm like I'm half keto because my wife is full on uh, into the keto thing, and uh, and it's been kind of amazing. Like you know, when you start lowering sugar, and you know, at first I was like, oh, this sounds like pseudoscience. And then now I'm like, oh no, it's actually it's kind of working. <laughs> oh, it I think but, it but, definitely works. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I go in and out of it. I mean, sometimes, um, yeah. you know, the holidays, it's it's kind of tough when you're visiting a family to kind of stick with something sure. that's. It's not. I wouldn't say it's restrictive, but it's definitely specific. The types of things you have to eat. So you know, yeah, my mom doesn't sure. understand why I don't want to eat. You know, like, it uh, calzones can be the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's kind of like yeah. what, you know, the, like I said, I haven't finished the entire novella, but sure. the, yeah. um, made me think about what actually makes up you, you know, for example, we have all these emotions and all of these different ideas that sometimes are reflections of these things inside of us. Like, for example, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm focusing on the gut here, you know what I mean? Cause sure. there's, yeah. That's there's a lot of neurons there. You know, so distress, cravings, um, you know, these very visceral reactions oftentimes yeah. come from these other organisms that are actually inside of our body that we have a symbiotic relationship with. Like we couldn't really exist without them and they couldn't really exist without us giving them nutrients. And that's kind of like yeah. what what made me like it that that percolated when I read these, you know, read the, you know, the parts that I read at least. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, a lot of it, the other impetus 
was um, I was uh, I was DJing like a, a, a show and I was playing some soundtracks from. I'm a I'm a big fan of like these like after the movie Alien came out they're like these like really bad. I mean, they're actually not that bad, but kind of bad compared to Alien. Like horror science fiction, like in Seminoid, um, Breeders. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and they're just like, you know, kind of like sub-level. Oh, Forbidden World is one of my favorite ones. That's it's a good so one. It, but it's really good. So, like, I was, I was, I, I, you know, these movies, I really love these soundtracks. I was watching these films. I remember them from when I was young, watching them on VHS. And, um, and they kind of, sent me into you know that with body horror you can kind of like these movies are kind of could be kind of dumb on on one level but there's this other level of subtext and which i think you know maybe like someone like david cronenberg kind of perfected with movies like shivers or rabid um video drum obviously like this yeah. apex right you know of, of how the body and technology uh, start to combine so you know those are you know I didn't really think of like other literature, but those movies have been kind of like, per, you know, like you're saying, like percolating in my head. And I started to think about the kind of metaphors or the kind of, uh, you know, ways you could use the body uh, to have this other conversation. And so on one hand, it was this mind body, like, is it all the mind that exists and just this war within the mind but between your mind and your body, or is it all just the body and like, it's kind of immediate, desires and needs um or is there a balance and you know where does consciousness fit into that um where does you know this concept of a soul or the you know all, all these kind of ideas started to open up this story in this weird way <laughs> and um uh you know where you know it's obviously inspired by a lot of these body horror films um but uh you know i really wanted to try and you know, I'm, I'm writing so i was trying to make this other so I would incorporate those kind of um, messages um, and different kind of scenes um, to to show this kind of separation of uh, the mind from the body uh, or distancing um, or and this new kind of entity that's in her mind uh, that's kind of controlling what she's doing um, and uh, and you know and then as that kind of spirals out of control um throughout the story throughout towards the end of the of the of the novel but um you know i think that that <laughs> those things kind of gave me some guideposts as i was um kind of conceiving of it and and pushing it forward the the idea of consciousness like if i remember correctly you went to college for uh religion and philosophy right I did. Yeah. You are correct. Yep. See? I, I, I do. My, my brain you have a good is, memory. yeah, man, you know, see, um, so some of the ideas of consciousness, do you think, you know, that's something that you've been working with like all these years? Is that something that you picked up in your studies about, you know, religion and, and philosophy and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. I mean, I don't feel that, you know, for me, like, you were saying earlier, like, you know, I, I have an output of my visual art, which is really all about like audio tape and these abstract compositions and my music, which kind of is all over the place. And each project like low cream is about the environment. You know, I kind of have these little sections where a lot of my creative output is, but with writing, I feel that like a lot of my other concerns, like, like my background in religion or my, or how like philosophy kind of introduces these, concepts to you and then they're just like yeah let's move on to the next entirely weird concept that you're you know like that your mind is not a part of your body like what do you do when someone introduces that idea to you you know and i like to me it's it's like you internalize it and you know maybe you think about it and you know some philosophers maybe kind of guide you or something but uh writing kind of helps me process through that and kind of come to terms with a lot of these great interesting ideas or interesting concepts about like religion and theology, which I've been kind of dealing with in some of my other stories and um, philosophy, like in, in this novella uh, where, you know, it doesn't necessarily fit like an album, you know, oh, yeah, definitely. Or, you know what I mean? Or like, you know, like, or, or a piece of visual art that I'm working on. So, 
the stories that kind of helped kind of loosen this valve and, and, you know, and, and, you know, I've been inspired by a lot of writers, like the new narrative scene, like uh, Kevin Killian or Kathy Acker and Dennis Cooper, who um, really kind of were just like, push it and don't, don't, don't put a filter on that really strange kind of narrative concept and, and kind of have some kind of kernel of honesty and, um, you know, and I always, their books seem just so weird and extreme, but I really appreciate them. And they've kind of definitely gave me this, like, all right, like I don't need to guard myself in the book and in the story, the way that I would like when I'm working with other people on the record, you know, or trying to cohere like 20 different pieces into an exhibition or something. It's a little bit more contained and time flows out differently in a store in a, in a story than it does like in a film or, or in visual art. So, but yeah, I mean, I think I come back to those, those ideas. I mean, it's some weird stuff, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it winds up being great inspiration for me. Well, De- Dennis Cooper is a very visceral writer. Um, damn. I, yeah. can't, I can't remember what, book I was reading the title has escaped me right now but I remember I was on the subway reading it and on on the back of the book above the barcode I guess it was classified under the pornography genre yeah and, uh, <laughs> I felt I felt a little uncomfortable on the train I'm like man I don't know people think I'm a creep reading porn but, well, well um, you know here's the thing right <laughs> is that pornography is like the most popular form of entertainment True. That nobody wants to talk about. So it's it's it like like when you look at the statistics of um, like there, I think I think uh, Motherboard does this article every year about what porn people were watching in different areas and like by these websites, um, search engines and stuff like that. And it just blows my mind like how the pretense of pornography as this forbidden thing when you realize that so many people are viewing it and it's become this kind of language. Um, I mean, obviously that word means many different things, right? Because there's so much and so many different kinds and genres and subgenres and all that stuff, just, you know, kind of like music. But I think that, you know, it's, it's all, it's kind of funny to me. And that was kind of like a realization that I had to come to. And I was, I wrote this story and I kind of sat in it for a while and like had my close friends read it and they're like, I was just like, if they tell me I'm crazy, I'm not going to do anything with it. But everyone was like, Oh, they really, they liked it. <laughs> so they were, they wanted to see what was going to happen when I released it and fought fell on my face. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I think that, you know, to me it's, it's like if we're not critiquing and we're not having a conversation about it, then it's just kind of metastasizing and we're seeing, you know, these, um, kind of very negative reflections or views of, um, you know, you kind of hear that, you know, in the, in the number two recently news story with Stormy Daniels, right? It's yeah. like, you know, you start to see people's perceptions, but it's like, then you think about the statistics, you know, like the, the same people that are cr- criticizing her and her life and her life choices are probably the same people that are watching content like hers or similar to her content that she's generated throughout her career. So it's, there are these kind of like, when you think of statistically and, and all that stuff, it's like pornography is, you know, a genre that most people have time they spend with. You know? Oh, I would say, I yeah. Think, I mean, the, you, you can't know? get an honest answer from anybody about that really, you know, sure. and, and, you know, and, and even, and even, you know, my, you know, fairly open mind, I still res- respond to feeling uncomfortable if I had something in public that was deemed pornographic. Oh, yeah, know? for sure. And I blame but that. I think like, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I, actually, you should finish. I, I was going to yeah. say that that's kind of like the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I blame that on the uh, the sort of Judeo-Christian, like, sort of viewpoint that the West has, Um with respect to, you know, the body and, and sexuality and all that sort of stuff. It's like a, you know, a very repressed kind of emotion that people have, you know, as a result of guilt, you know, and all this other stuff. Sure. And, you know, I think that had our society evolved differently and that wasn't such a, a heavy influence, um, 
you know, especially here in the United States, I just, I think, you know, we'd have a healthier viewpoint on that sort of stuff, the body and our relationship to the body and sure. how other people's bodies come into play, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that like Dennis Cooper, um, you know, I mean, if you read, I mean, I, I think that his novel, the sluts, it's like my favorite, uh-huh. Uh, one of his, um, I think that that one deals a lot with mythology and um, message boards. And I mean, you know, it, it's obviously kind of coming from this queer space and his um, writing. But when I read that, I just thought I felt like it was the most honest interpretation of how the Internet kind of worked at that time. Um and, uh, you know, and I, I really just was blown away. And, um, and I feel that he has this, you know, whether it's, um, you know, in like Frisk or something like that, like, um, you know, your, your own desires and or the character's desires really, um, you know, and how there's this prism that kind of connects it. And that tends to be like, a pornographic image or, you know, whatnot that kind of refracts what, what the character's motivations are. And, um, you know, I feel that he kind of did that incredibly well, um, still does. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, but I understand, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, and, you know, I think that, that, uh, having that on the, on the train, you know, yeah. you, you, should, you could put like a little book cover, a little dust jacket over it. Or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading a cookbook, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> but, you know, I think that, um, you know, you know, for me, it was, you know, Dennis Cooper was definitely this writer when I found him, you know, it really kind of helped out. Uh, same thing with like Kathy Acker's blood, blood and guts in high school, um, and, uh, Kevin Killian's like impossible princess, uh, spread Eagle, which was a few years ago. Uh, they're just these great writers who are pretty bold. <laughs> there's, you know, there's no way around it. They're, they're these great writers. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that they were kind of in my mind a little bit, they were a little bit of a guiding, like it's okay and I'm going to push myself through to whatever the end of the story is going to be. Um, and you know, like they made it up to the other side somehow. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I don't think that my book is anywhere near what, what they were doing, but you know, they, they definitely kind of like, let me take a few deep breaths and get back into it and try and get the story out the way that, the way that I was like seeing it happen with, with all these ideas. Now, one of the, one of the big questions I have, and this is something that I ponder myself is what actually are your thoughts on consciousness? Ah, yeah. And this book deals with a lot of that stuff. Well, I think that, you know, I don't really know if I have like a definitive answer because it's a, maybe evolving. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, in the book, you know, it really is about, you know, what makes the, the person, right? Is it, these kind of physical characteristics and how the world affects you physically um, is it all kind of like your, your mental capacity of like taking in external stimuli and processing it and the body is secondary. Um, and, it, and I think in the book, it moves between and kind of evolves um, and then kind of, and towards the end kind of reflects back in a way. It's almost like this helix um, uh, between those, those ideas. I mean, I think like maybe, for myself, I have, you know, for me, phenomenology was probably the most important group of philosophers uh, that I got into. Um, and for them, it was like about synthesis. It's not just um, about this kind of these intellectual processes. You're not just the brain and the that, you know, uh, you know, other minds exist, uh, you know, that, that, that feel pain and joy and suffering and sorrow and happiness and all that stuff, just like you do. Um, you know, and they have these complex processes to get to that point. But, you know, I, I actually feel kind of more aligned with that, which is, it's like a very, you know, kind of French way of, you know, in philosophy, like of, of, of consideration. But I, I think that, you know, that they kind of got me 
uh, over that hump, you know, when I, I learned that stuff and I learned the arguments and all these other philosophical stuff in college. But then when I was out of college, I read like the phenomenology of perception by Maurice Merleau Ponty um, and uh, stuff by like Edmund Husserl and which is not the most fun to read. Merleau Ponty is a lot of fun to read. I actually think he's a really good uh, writer. Um, and he's also concerned a lot with art, um, with your senses, um, and, you know, perception. That's a really important thing that inspired a lot of other, like the minimalist artists in the 70s were really interested in Maurice Merleau Ponty. He was a writer that kind of, they went back to. So to me, it's, it's about like a synthesis of, you know, what happens with your body and your mind and you know your and your you know, consciousness it all kind of is together it's not these kind of separate things um which doesn't really lead me to a very spiritual kind of conclusion <laughs> but uh which i'm fine with um but you know i think i think that like um you know that that, that those philosophers i mean like you know even jean paul sartre kind of discusses that in being in nothingness um, you know, that, that, that it's, it's bound, your internal experience and your external experience of the world are bound together. It's not, um, kind of mutually exclusive. Like a lot of philosophers before them were trying to argue, um, as these kind of intellectual exercises. Um, I think that, I mean, I think for me, at least to kind of assist and then you can have some more empathy towards other people. Um, you know, if, if you can believe that they could suffer, like you suffer, feel pain or feel happiness, you can kind of empathize with them when, when they are experiencing it and you're not, you know, it's like these really basic things, but I think like when we look at, especially I think when we get to technology, there's this distancing that can happen. That's kind of encouraged that you're observing a video or, um, someone's Instagram that you don't have to interact with, um, you know, that it's not, you know, kind of like uh, an exchange in some way, like you would have in the conversation. Um, it can be, you know, but most of the time, you know, it can kind of be just very passive observation or surveillance. Um, yeah. It's, it's like this vicarious connection you have with people, you know, and, and um, yeah. in, in a way, it's very much like when we, we mentioned pornography earlier, it's like taking sure. someone else's experience and getting some sort of gratification from it. And, exactly. You know, I, in a lot of ways, that's kind of like what all this social media stuff is, is uh, serving. Yeah. I think that it isn't all, but I, I, I think that it, it does kind of, you know, you want some gratification, right? Like, you know, there's been like those good studies about like when you get likes on a post or when someone retweets something of yours or, you know, like there's, there's all this like, you know, like your endorphins go up. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, you, you feel good. Like it, and it does feel good. You can't deny it. And it feels terrible when you post something cool and like no one likes it. And you're like, <laughs> what's wrong with everybody? Is it yeah. broken? <laughs> you know? No, totally. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's weird how I think, especially for, for, people like yourself and myself who remember a time before this where, I mean, you know, even think about being in the band before social media. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're like, you're like, you're like, Oh man, I, I sent that guy seven bucks. And I still haven't gotten that seven inch. Like yeah. what's wrong with that guy. Nope. <laughs> right. And then maybe a month later after that guy put down the bong and realized he had like all these envelopes and $7 in them. You like, he like, like, Oh shit. I got like, mail them out you know? yeah it, it, it's like you know like it's just crazy like to be you know and and to think that your performance when you were on tour was the one way that people saw you and interacted with you and became friends with you that's you know? actually and, and, my biggest gripe about everything is not having the control like control over what people like say you're you're playing a set someone records it with like their phone it sounds awful and then it's on YouTube and everyone's experiencing yeah. the band as like this sort of weird, you know, <laughs> representation of something. It does, you know what I mean? Like if the guy's standing on one side of the stage, he gets all like the rhythm guitar. He gets like one guitar. Yeah. It's like one guitar and cymbals. 
is yeah. a lot of symbols. Always symbols. <laughs> Always a lot of symbols. Always symbols. Uh, you know, I, I never really, that doesn't, because I, I always feel that that impulse is honest. I mean, maybe I'm being naive, but I always feel like when someone's like, I'm going to record this band or take a picture of this band or whatever it is, I always feel it's like because they really like what's happening. You know? Okay. Like, so I'm always just kind of like, well, that's fine. You know, I might hate that picture. Um, I don't really mind um, normally, but like, it's like, oh man, that was a bad angle. I look like I don't have a chin, yeah, you, know? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or like, you know, or like you're saying, it's audio, you know, so it's all these emotions that how you're represented, really, right? Um, Absolutely. And, and, you know, I mean, I think that, but you know, the bands, there's like bootlegs of, you know, it goes back a long time since you could home tape and bring yeah. the device with you and, That's you true. know, all that stuff. I, I think like, you know, you, like, you know, like you think that the, there's an arc and you hope that it's not just going to end, <laughs> you know, at, uh, at, yeah. at that concert that it's going to get better, you know? Yeah. But, uh, I think that, you know, in some ways it can be, you know, I mean, think about it, like you'll find out about a band because you left YouTube on too long. Yeah, that's and true. Some, some awesome starts playing. You're like, what is this? And then you find out, you know, it's a band that you would never have put on, you know, like for whatever reason you're like, and then you're, it becomes, you know, your favorite thing, you know? So I, I think that, um, it is a give and take with everything, but, you know, I think that that kind of, experience though of you know living vicariously through someone else's experience right like um what they call that like the instagram tourism like that you're trying to attract people to a city like nashville for like to make sure that you get it on the on the instagram you know like mm, yeah. I, I just, i'm like that that's just so interesting to me it's, it's fascinating that maybe i'll use it in the story sometime but <laughs> it's, it's like a, it's like a really weird situation it, 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 it you know i think when it's your own content your own fans or you know your own art you know like if someone starts using it for their own design or something like that you know then it can get a little bit like oh man <laughs> like yeah i was sharing it yeah. to promote myself and you know but um you know i think i think yeah there's that lack of control which can be exciting because you can find something cool but it can also if you're like that was the worst night of the tour and that's the one that guy got the video of yeah. and now it's a thousand people have watched it on YouTube. Why? <laughs> or or you know, it's like when sometimes when um you know it's it's at a decent venue where there's a PA and what happens is you hear just kick drum and vocals, you know. Yeah. It's like that's like the worst when yeah. you know it's some big, you know, multiple metal band package and, uh, you know, you're, there's like five bands playing and you get like a quick line check and then you uh, play and then it's just like vocals yep. and yep. just the kick drum <laughs> and that's it. And then you don't hear any of the guitars or bass or anything like that, you know, and that, uh, that's, that always sucks when I, when that happens. <laughs> yep. It does. Yep. <laughs> yeah. We always, I know it like with low cream, we always try and demand like, you know, a sound check because yeah. just because I, I run so many things direct with all my electronics. I'm just like, I got to know, I got to be able to hear it, you know? Um, and then everybody else is just so freaking loud, you know, it's like, you know, but uh, you don't always get it. <laughs> now, do you, so, do you run, all right, I, I've seen you guys play, but I wasn't really paying attention. Yeah. And also it's very, it was very dark on stage. I remember um, yeah. do you, do you actually run your gear through amplification on stage? Like, do you bring like a backline no. with you or do you rely on the monitors? I do not. I rely on monitors and that's, it's worked, but you know, if we're on tour and there's like a venue that, that is just not capable of doing that, um, maybe it's have like a vocal PA or something mm -hmm. like, I'll you know, I'll just try and make sure I can get someone in town to get me like a, a decent keyboard or bass amp or you know i can i can run things through that it's not a problem it's just i prefer it because then everybody like the you know steven our drummer can get a little bit and yeah. andre can get some it's like everybody can get it in the monitors where they want it um you know and 
it does work better. But and you know, I'm uh, I, I'm I don't look forward to lifting amps. Oh, I dude, don't. Who does? <laughs> Especially so it's uh, like you know. Especially those SVT base cabinets. Those things are right? like, huge. It's not fun. It's not fun moving furniture every day. You're a furniture <laughs> mover. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Well, back to the uh, the writing. Um, sure. Now, do you, like your process, do you outline everything or do you do a lot of research? Uh, like what's, do you just kind of hang out and write? Like what's what's the uh, the process like for you? Well, I have found that, you know, occasionally like a short story will like be beginning to end, you know, written, you know. Yeah. But normally like a novella, especially like all internal, I was like, I had a lot, I would write outlines. I would like edit the outlines and like sort of it helps because it's kind of like, it's kind of like when you're, I mean, I don't know, like I, you know, when you're using like digital music software and you can be like, I want this part right here. And then you, yeah. know, you can just kind of like flip it and look at the order and kind of think about the different subtext and the through lines. And so I like outlining. I know a lot of other writers maybe don't, but it helps me, especially with, you know, I have a lot of projects I'm always working on. So it just, you know, when I have time to write and I try to have, I try to write like every day a little bit, you know, it's just like 500 words or whatever. Um, for me, it's like, I can actually, you know, it's like, all right, I have this amount of time. I can focus on this uh, component or that component and get that done. Um, you know, and, and that it does help kind of check things off my list, to, you know? Yeah. I imagine like on a longer piece, you wouldn't be able to do it without outlining, um, you know, just for yeah. pacing and that sort of stuff too, you know? Exactly. I'll even like, sometimes I'll even as it gets further along and I'm like, if you kind of look at every chapter or component as interchangeable, so I'll just kind of like have a little post-it notes and I'll move things around and where do I want to introduce this thread or this through, you know, like, and, um, and that'll help kind of map it out. Um, I just, I finished a novel recently, so I've been like, that was probably the most work I've done where I just have these like long drawn out maps of what's happening and what's happening behind what's happening and all this other stuff. So it, um, you know, it, it gets pretty intense, but it's, it, it really helps, at least for me, um, helps out. And then I do do a lot of research, um, whether it's just like reading a lot of articles, um, reading interviews with people, um, you know, or just like trying to comprehend, you know, to me, it's like a lot of vocabulary because I think like trying to like establish people's social class is important, mm -hmm. um, in stories. So like thinking about how they would say things or where they're from, how they say things in, in that, uh, situation, whether it's from the accent or whatnot, but things like that are always important to me. Um, and then, you know, just, you know, a lot of times I'll have, the kind of articles I've been saving and piling on. Um, and then I'll start to see like these weird, like conflations of stories that are like, that maybe I wouldn't have seen before because I've just been saving them. And I'll start just kind of you know, collecting that and that will become this other idea. So I kind of feel like I'm always researching, like I'm always reading, I'm always like looking for something else, um, whether it's from philosophy or from environmental science articles or, um, you know, I just, I just kind of save a lot of content and then later on I'll realize it kind of got combined with something else, you know, yeah. and, uh, um, you know, like, like interpreting pornography through the mind body problem, like it's just it's these weird ideas that I have, like in my head, like I should write about that, combine it with this and it all just kind of all fit together. And I was like, I think that's something. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's kind of, how I'll, and sometimes that's how it'll start will be just like I've collected all this research and then it's kind of made this weird story in my head um, and then you know sometimes you have to get rid of it because like you've written a lot and then that original idea wasn't that strong but it got you to this other place and I think that's the hardest part I think is kind of like honing it editing it making it a little bit better tighter you know all that stuff and that can take forever yeah, yeah. It sound, like, sounds all like songwriting too you know yeah, exactly yeah like you have a riff and then like you're like oh man this is a good riff it doesn't go with the song what's the second part i don't know 
how's it end? I don't, you know, like, how do we start? You know, like, how do we get to that awesome riff? We need like two minutes of something <laughs> to get to that cool thing. Cause we can't just start with that. Cause it's too cool. Do we repeat the riff or is it just one time? You know, like actually all these like, you know, that's questions. how some of the best low green material is, man. Like you have the, the payoff riffs are somewhere in the middle of your guys' songs. It's like, you know, it, it's, you know, you guys make everyone wait to get that awesome riff. We do. We yeah. are not for people with, although I have a short attention span, we're not for people with short attention spans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you need yeah, time. Yeah. You need to put time in. You yeah. guys, too, you guys write some epic stuff and tunes, man. It's like, there's a lot of, like, movements that happen, you know? Yeah. Like, well, yeah, we try. You know? Try, try uh, to do our know. best. <laughs> but you know, it's like you have these parts or like someone brings this a really cool bass line or a neat, you have this awesome drum progression and you're like, where does that part go now? And now you got to like fit it in there and make it make sense. And, you know, is it in the right key with this other thing we wrote three years ago that we threw away? You know? Oh yeah, I save everything, you know? man. I have yeah. demos upon demos of, of just exactly. every little piece of, whatever that we wrote and you know and as as you know it never springs complete you know it's exactly you know it's I mean, always it's similar you know I, I i actually started like i keep like um the last three years i mean i keep a little notebook and sometimes it'll just be an outline where i'm just like oh like this should happen or i'll like be at work or i'll be walking the dog and i'll be like oh this character should i'll think of something in their background that might not be mentioned but it'll be something that i'll like i'll write it down like okay this is like a motivation for them as this event's occurring or whatever and you know i'll just kind of have thought of it like oh you know that happens so to me it's like yeah i always kind of hang on to that content um because you never know when you're going to need it um, and especially if it makes your story more, you know, all encompassing and can kind of bring people in and believe in this. Like for me, um, I'm writing a lot of like weird ish fiction. Uh, so it's like you want to have something that's kind of believable, you know, that people can kind of fall into and then get it all, mess it all up, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you mentioned that you're into horror soundtracks and uh, are, you, are you still doing sure. Dead Air? I am, yeah. I do it on uh, um, WLOY here in uh, Baltimore for uh, Loyola University, um, and uh, it's. Um, it, I did it last year, and I'll occasionally do some DJing with it, um, and then I write like a column for the Horror Writers Association every month. I pick a different soundtrack, and uh, that's for like members only in our newsletter, but. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, so this, this, uh, last month was on, uh, the innocent, um, mm. which is a great, um, movie from the sixties. Um, really weird, but Daphne Orem did these electronic sounds for it. You know, she did like the Dr. Who sounds for the original Dr. Who. And, um, she's an amazing electronic musician, the pioneer of electronic music. Um, so I really wanted to focus on her. This is this great stuff in the soundtrack anyway, but, um, that was uh, a great one. And before that, I did like Get Out, which has great, oh, yeah. great mm -hmm. soundtrack. Definitely. Um, and uh, so I was kind of pick, I, I try and like jump around um, timelines, you know, and you, know, you can't do Goblin like every month. Yeah. Um, but I did, I did do, um, uh, I did do uh, Deep Red. Oh, that nice. was like the first, the first one they worked on um, with Argento. And that was a lot of fun to go to and a, a great soundtrack. Um, I'm really stoked on the Tenebra uh, um, reissue that's coming out on like Waxworks. Uh, it looks really good, but I, that's a great soundtrack, um, you know. But, uh, you know, I can't, I can't write about Goblin for like another year. So, you know, <laughs> okay, you, know you have to like, you have to make it different, you know, and bring in stuff that's unexpected. So I think I did like It Follows. Mm -hmm. um, Disaster piece, piece. yeah, a, yeah, that was a great that was soundtrack. Sick. Yeah, I just, I just try and do something contemporary and something you know, like more formative. So, I think I might do like a big Bernard Herman one, but I probably should follow up the innocence with something more contemporary. Um, and you know, I, I just try and 
keep it broad. So I guess like about a thousand words a month that I write on different soundtrack. And I try and bring instances for writers. So with Innocence a lot, was a lot about Henry James Turn of the Screw um, and the play The Innocence that was made kind of after the book. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun though. I love that story. I like Henry James. So it was a lot of fun to kind of talk about the story, talk about the movie and the choices that they made in the movie, um, that was different. Um, but, uh, also, you know, and I think that, you know, when you get to something like Get Out, it's maybe not so clear. So I kind of went to the music and talked to all these different music cues because it's not like a written source. Um, you know, they wasn't based off a book. Right. Uh, so I try and, and like, you know, with each one connect it to a story or talk about a book that was maybe in it or a song that kind of could lead you to something else. But so it's been a lot of fun to do that. Um, you know, last year I wrote uh, um, an article for Bandcamp on different soundtracks that were on their website. And I did another one about female composers uh, for Noisy, um, all about horror films. Um, so I got to talk about Forbidden World. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, she's a really, I, I, I'm blank on her name right now, but, uh, she's a great composer. Um, and it's a great soundtrack. Um, and, uh, um, and Ed talked about like, um, uh, Legend of Hell House, um, and, um, uh, The Innocence actually, um, and, uh, Jocelyn Poots, who did, um, uh, um, like um, it was a while ago, so I'm kind of like blank a little bit. Um, but she did, um, if I remember correctly, she did the uh, Eyes Wide Shut weird soundtrack, and then she okay. did um, another film. Uh, I think like they came back, the French zombie kind of. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. That was yeah, actually really good. Has yeah, really eerie score, and mm -hmm. I, I think she's really interesting. So. Um, you know, there's a, a bunch of, you know, really great composers, but so I get to do that stuff. It's kind of fun. And, um, you know, I, I think I talked to you earlier about doing a podcast, but it's just, you know, putting music on a podcast is going to be, uh, probably yeah, a bad idea. So I, when I found this, this radio show and I've kind of been talking to them about maybe expanding it, I don't know if they're going to want horror radio soundtrack, horror soundtracks throughout the year, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, they want me to kind of continue DJing. So I might, I might do something else with them. Um, yeah, it's fun but, uh, oh man, it's great. And I did, I did a, a clipping was on tour with youth code and I DJed that night, uh, all just horror soundtracks because, um, those guys and clipping are huge, uh, horror soundtrack fans. Um, and it was hilarious. They just walked by and be like, is this, um, you know, the Hills have eyes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're probably like one of the only other person in the room that knows where this came from, you know, like, uh, just like, you know, they were great. But, uh, and it, it was, that's always fun. Like to have that kind of interaction too, you know, you know, it seems like the, the horror soundtrack scene is, is kind of like on the rise, especially with all these different labels like Waxworks and death waltz and, you know, releasing these, really cool yeah. formats, you know, with awesome packaging and everything. What, um, yeah, it's, it's out sorry. of control. Yeah. Go ahead. What, uh, what are some of your favorite scores? Like, you know, just aside from the ones uh, that you've written about, like, what would you say is your favorite older score? And maybe what is one of your favorite contemporary scores? Uh, my, my most favorite, uh, ever, um, is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre score yeah. um, by Toby Hooper and, and Wayne Bell. Um, I also love it because you have to watch the movie to hear it. They didn't record it separately. So there aren't like audio tracks. Uh, there's some great stories about what the like, cow stoned everybody was and uh, that they didn't do that. And I don't think they knew, you know, at the time. And at the time, like, who cares about your soundtrack? It's not like, you know, but at that time, right? Yeah. Um, so I just think it's great. Um, I really would love it if someone could do a really great rip and do a nice record. I think it's a, it's like the best industrial record, you know, it's all just like chains and yeah. like bones being scraped and it's awesome. Um, that's my favorite. That's probably like, I mean, the one that got me into soundtracks was, uh, Goblin's work for Dawn of the Dead. Uh, when I first saw that movie, I was just like, what are those instruments? What is that song? You know, I, I just kind of got, sucked into it and I found the soundtrack and 
you know, like back when you know ordered these CDs, uh, and they weren't the best, you know, and um, and that got me into Fabio Fritzi and all these other composers, um, and you know, and I started paying attention to Ennio Morricone, and you know, and it was it was this kind of just kind of built up, and and I play synthesizer, so to me it was just like at that time when I was younger. It kind of got me way more into synthesizers. Like, oh, like they're using it in this way. That's really interesting. That, you know, how they do that? Do they use it? And then you learn about sequencers and, you know, kind of like, you know, and then at that time it was a bit harder. You wouldn't have the internet. But, uh, and then obviously as the internet came along, you could find all these scores that like, you would just hear about or you'd see the movie and be like, well, that sounds cool. And then like you'd realize, oh, well, some British label or Italian or Japanese label did that on CD. And, you know, you can find it, but so it's great now. Um, but my contemporary score, um, man, I'm going to have to say just cause I, um, you know, I really think that it follows score is something special. Yeah, um, definitely. I think, I, th- I think it's uh pretty beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm really loving the score on this, on that AMC show, the terror. I don't know if you've watched that. Yet. You know what, man, um, I need to check that out. Yeah. It is, it is the, it is one of the best shows on television. I think the acting is phenomenal. I don't, I didn't read the book. I've heard very mixed things. I've, I have a lot of friends who love it. A lot of friends who just thought it was tedious. Um, all of them love the show though. So I guess the show is very good. Uh, but uh, the soundtrack is that they use Lust Mord on one of the episodes. Oh, wow. It was cool. insane. I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, but it was, it was great. It was, it's just a, it's a great show and the score is absolutely beautiful. Um, and the audio design, um, throughout it, it's just like, if you, if you put headphones on and listen to music, you're going to just sit there and the tension they do because the boats are being crushed in the ice Mm -hmm. and they, and throughout it, they kind of ramp up these, these boards bending and creaking and all this stuff as like, really intense events happen. And I, I you know, probably by the second episode, I was like, these guys are geniuses, like the audio, just cause it's so subtle, like how they built it up. I, I really, I, I think probably every week my wife and I were just like, this is brilliant. Like the staging, like the, as the episodes wear on and things get more out of hand, like their ships are tilting. And so the cameras are tilting and it's all tense. And I just, I think it's brilliant. Like all these details, that they've been kind of they're plodding you through to like get you to this really. Yeah, I, I need to. Um, that's that's something I'm probably going to binge watch. But I've heard a lot of great things about it. Yeah, I've heard uh, the reviewers that got all the copies, like they got to see the whole thing. They're just like, oh my, like we, I can't even talk about it. They're just like, like this is like a shame. You should be able to bi- watch this thing from start to finish. It's so good. Like they're, you know, like they're like, cause that's what they got to, they got to watch it from episode one to episode 10. And, you know, it's like episode six is out, you know? So it's, it's great. I'm, I'm a huge fan. I don't know, like if there's a season two on the horizon, I have no idea. Um, but it is just like, it's, it's really good. I, I've, I've been, you know, that and that show, there's that show dark. It was on Netflix. Yeah. The, uh, Swedish, right. The German. Yeah. German. Yeah. That, that one is, that, that, that was really good. It's kind of, Lost meets Stranger Things and and whatnot, but I I I love that premise with a much shorter amount of episodes than Lost. You know? Yeah, so. definitely. <laughs> yeah, that was that was good. But, I enjoyed that one too. Yeah, I thought that one was really good. I actually liked it more than Stranger Things season two. I I, I really did. I I tend to agree with you. Stranger Things season yeah. one killed it, and two oh, yeah. kind great. of slipped a little bit. Oh yeah, I, I think you know they they have all the all the material there. They'll be fine on season three, but yeah, season two kind of lost me a little bit. I was like, mm, no, I'm not with it. Apparently, season but, three is going to do a little time slip a few years into the future. Oh, that's, interesting. Uh, that's what I read. Like the kids are going to be a little bit older, and you know, it's a little time slip there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Netflix has made us very um, spoiled with being able to watch oh, yeah. things in its Everything, entirety. Yeah. 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 That's Just, true. There's actually a pretty pretty cool um, amount of decent horror that's on Netflix right now. You have to look for, for sure. it, but it's there. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think a... like the in, the invitation. Have you seen that one? Yeah, yeah, it was great. That 
that was creepy. great. I, I probably wouldn't have watched it, but a, a friend recommended it, and I, I was that soundtrack is awesome, and the movie is really really good. I was totally blown away. Like I was like, this came out of nowhere, never heard of it, you know, and very skeptical, but it was really good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we covered that on um, on my other. Uh, podcast oh, the yeah, yeah. yeah that was like yeah. you know, a year or so ago we covered that uh there's a couple of good foreign horror films on netflix right now there's this movie called ravenous which is french canadian um, oh wow okay and um i've seen it but okay I'll, i will i will look yeah on the list. It, it kind of like because there's another film called ravenous from the 90s that has guy pierce in it which is uh that's right it's like a period piece uh you know about the Wendigo, basically. Yeah. And this okay. one is obviously different, and it has a very interesting take on zombies in it, which um, and I'll, oh, leave interesting. It, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, I'll watch it. And then there sure. was The Ritual, which... Uh, did you read the book, oh, or have you seen it? Or? No, I've been hearing about that. i got to watch that one. Yeah, that's, that's added to my list too as well. Yeah, you're like the second person recently to tell me about it. All right. All right, I, 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 I saw the movie it. first. <laughs> I thought it was good. I read the book, and the book just destroys the movie. Oh, okay. That's the book is way better. So if you want to enjoy the movie, do not read the book first. That's my okay. recommendation. All right. Movie first, then book. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, is, the, is the book available yet? Is it or is it still yeah, pre-order? Available April it's available April 30th, so it'll be available this week. Okay. Um, and... Uh, yeah, we've been doing pre-orders and it's been interesting. This is with Dinotopic Ministries. Uh, it's been publishing like kind of weird horror and body horror stuff for a while now. Um, and uh, Jordan Crawl is a really great guy. And, um, you know, he, he was immediately kind of picked up on this from um, a mutual friend of ours. And, uh, and I was really excited to work with him. So it's been pretty easy <laughs> to do so. Is there going to be like an audio book and like an ebook and all that stuff? Because uh, that seems to be like this trend in in uh, publishing these days. Uh, not at the moment. We kind of just like let's just put the book out and we'll just kind of see you know where that goes. Um, he doesn't normally do like the Amazon stuff, so we kind of figured later on maybe I'll I'll do it or something like that on my own. Yeah. Um, but uh, at the moment we're just gonna do physical. I don't know, kind of old school. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny just the whole publishing world. Um you know, it seems harder and harder to get a publishing deal these days for for, you know, fiction. I uh I have not been at, uh, this book I was I was trying my last novella I had a, two publishers that were interested and made me hold them, hold it for a year oh, before they yeah. kind of were, were like, "Oh, we're not, we're not gonna go through with it in the end," which was really sad. So it was very strange. They were indie publishers, but um, uh, this was actually relatively painless. Uh, I mean, but I didn't send it, submit it to any publisher that hadn't already been interested in body horror mm -hmm. in some way. I kind of just did a lot of research and just made sure that the audience would be receptive to this type of book um, where I was submitting. Um, obviously, like, you know, I can wax on about all this other philosophical stuff, but it, it's still like about, you know, weird alien living inside a woman who does porn. So, you know, it's like, you know, where are you going to, where does this go? You know, um, and it's a novella and novellas are always a little bit challenging um, to, uh, to do. Um, a lot of publishers uh, won't even, touch it if it doesn't get to 50 or 60,000 words. Um, so the bell is the shorter. Um, so some publishers just like, even if they like it, they, just, they know that they can't market it and get it out there, but unless if you're like super famous or something and they can up the font size or whatever. <laughs> Any chance so, of combining this with beneath the remains in some future volume? I thought about that for sure. I think, I think it would work out. Um, the very different stories, but uh, I think, I think I would definitely be interested in that, but you know, I, now that this novella is coming out, like I have this new novel that I'm just about, I'm editing. I have like a reading group that's been giving me feedback. 
Um, and I've just been kind of moving it into its place where I can start uh, submitting it to the right kind of publisher. And um, so, you know, that'll be probably my next big focus outside of, you know, trying to get short stories published and stuff like that. But it's not do other you, crap I'm doing. So. <laughs> do you work with the same editor on all these projects or different people? Um, well, I, I, I work with, um, you know, the publisher obviously. And then I have, uh, my sister is a copy editor. Huh. I have her kind of make sure I, I've made the correct sentences, um, <laughs> and everything. And then I have a, a good friend, uh, my friend Jordan Reyes, who, um, is a musician and he actually reads most of these manuscripts and kind of comes back with a lot of notes. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm, it's the hardest part of thing about most creation is like to be able to take some of that feedback. Um, I just kind of go in like, you know, does it help the story? Does that make it clearer? I'm, okay, cool. Then let's, let's, let's go with that. Like, you know, I, I just want to make sure that what I'm saying is what gets intended. But, uh, you know, those are like typically friends or family that kind of walk me through that process. Cause no matter how good you are at it, you know, you'll always, kind of skip over a part that you think is perfect and then they'll find something weird in there and um because they're not as attached to it and as in it as you are um, yeah there's a certain objectivity that can come exactly in cold and, and yeah I've, I've always like i've never written fiction before but um i always imagine that being the crucial part of the process you know as the editorial oh, yeah. part yeah you kind of you got i mean i think with any writing whether it's Right about music or art or you know with your fiction it's just like once you get to the editing stage it's like everybody has the same goal you hope of getting that piece across the finish line and making it great um and making sure that the right audience is going to find it so you know i always kind of listen to the editors <laughs> and uh you know if it's like if it's a point i'm making uh you know i'll articulate it better um you know and make sure that i'm again like as clear as i can be um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to like mechanics and vocabulary or whatever, it's like, it's always great to have someone else's voice kind of like at the end of it, just be like, you know, or give you that note about like, this is a great little passage. Hey, fix this little thing. You know, I have a question about this usage or whatever. And, you know, I think you have to kind of set that aside yourself, your ego aside a little bit and, and just kind of like, let's get it over the finish line and, you know, don't, you know, there are battles worth fighting and editing and sure. um, for sure, you know, and, and there's battles that, you know, like you need, you're learning too, or I'm learning, you know, that's how I view it. But yeah, it's funny. Like in a, in a musical analog to this is when we recorded Savage Gold. It was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the first time we worked with uh, Eric, Eric Rutan as a producer. And he was the first guy to put the brakes on all the overdubs. <laughs> oh, whoa. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I, and I, I actually thank him for that because, um, you know, it's kind of a similar idea. The more stuff you add, it may be sort of distracts the listener from the actual intent of the song. And, yeah. um, you know, so moving forward from that point, I've always had this kind of minimalist, uh, approach to some of the overdubs and you know guitar textures yeah, and things we're adding i think you know having that you know obviously some bands that can never work you know yeah. but i think that it's the hardest and it's sometimes the hardest part is like having that extra voice come into whatever your group is and say do it this way try <laughs> yeah. it this other way don't do it that way you know um and uh you know and I, I look forward to that. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm probably not going to work with someone who I don't feel has something to contribute, you know, and, um, you know, whether it's Locring records with, um, Greg Norman, at electrical audio and, mm -hmm. um, the Holy circle we recorded with Jay Robbins, um, here in Baltimore. And, you know, they are very different engineers and different styles. Like, um, but they all, you know, I've worked with both of them because I knew that they're going to give their opinion freely and offer solutions and, you know, uh, work with you. And I think that obviously it's different, you know, Greg is definitely with Locri and more of like a fourth member sometimes kind of helping cohere things and, you know, remembering things we did from years ago with him and, 
Um, you know, I think with, with Jay, it was a lot about like placement and tech technique and stuff like that, that, uh, really helped out when we were recording that the Holy circle record with him. But, um, you know, I think that that's hard to in a group dynamic. I mean, I think it's one thing when it's like you and an editor, editor going back and forth on email in a Google document, you know, when you're sitting in a room and in your head, you're like, I'm paying for this. You know, or how much am I paying for this, or am I paying in the future? You know, whatever. Um, that can change sometimes. <laughs> you know that that vibe, or when there's a band member who just is like not direction that the other band members are and the engineer are going. You know, that can always be a a frustrating moment. You know, and obviously historically bands have broken up. You know, from that creative difference that occurs. You know, in, in the studio. Yeah, some not everyone is open. Everyone, you know, sometimes yeah. people are really, you know, married to these very specific ideas, and uh, you know that can be a, a long, protracted discussion as to what we actually do moving forward. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. There's something. Um, there's a little phrase that I found. Uh, for, was, I think it was an interview I read. Decaying abstract patterns. Hmm. Yeah. It like had that. to do. It had to do with your um, your your visual art. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. It sounds cool. Like, but what what the hell does I it like mean that. though? What does it mean? <laughs> uh, uh, it was about my work. It was about I your work. Yeah. About... Oh. Um, I think you actually used it to describe some of your work. Well, well, you know, I think that uh, you know, with my work, you know, most of them they're geometric or patterns. Um, and they're all made with audio tape. Um, right. so they're, they're falling apart. You know, they're not being saved for posterity. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a big part of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that I, I like, uh, if I said that, then that was a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, had a nice <laughs> ring to it, I thought. Um, but you know, I love it, you know, for what I'm, interested in is like these kind of obsolescent materials like consumer grade cassette tape or you know studio grade audio tape now um where um you know the tape uh is the surface this thing that contains data now is being used a different way and it's silent um and um has new the new use to make this other object you know rather than be you know a Guns N' Roses use your illusion two tape or whatever. <laughs> I don't know why I have a stack of those. Just use illusion two that people have donated to me for my work. So I, that record's fine. I don't need five of them, but no, <laughs> record's fine. <laughs> but no. Yeah. Well, that answered another question about that. I just that stuck out, and I'm like, man, this is like I have to steal this somehow as a lyric. Go for it, or, man. Take it. Know. It's yours. I hope, I hope I said that. I maybe I'll name smart. I'll name the new tunes <laughs> record that decaying abstract pattern. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. There you go. You're welcome. All right. So <laughs> to wrap all this up, uh, where sure. can people um, order the book? Because it's still in pre-order right now. It is. So it'll be available on the 30th um, from Dynatox Ministries, um, and uh, I'll send you the the link so that you can put it in in. I guess on the podcast. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it'll be there and then it'll be in a few shops, um, that are taking that kind of horror fiction and body horror stuff. So a few places said they want some copies. So it'll be like at a comic books here in Baltimore. And, um, I think a few of the places that Jason, that uh, Jordan has, uh, lined up. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And do you have like some kind of like, um, you know, website or uh oh, yeah. know, author profile that people can can you know hit you up at or just something like head that. over to com. Just, just some art and then i have a blog on there that talks all about the writing and i have links to different stories um and uh and books and stuff and you can pick up beneath the remains there and um from anathemata editions by small press um and um you know see some of the art and um a bunch of the fiction I've been writing and links to music and all that stuff all on there for sure. Awesome. Thanks, well, thank man. you. Uh, thank you, Terrence. Thanks Mike. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And thanks yeah. for listening. Everyone out there. 